Hey everyone, thanks so much for checking out this content on the Hillview YouTube channel. My name's Martin. Uh, my name is Scott. Uh, we're two of the pastors at the church and it's our joy to welcome you to this time. We would love it if you're able to come and join us in person. If you'd like to do that, there's some contact details at the end of the video for how you can get in touch and we'd love to connect you up in that way. Uh, but we also understand that maybe you don't feel that you're able to join us in person yet. And so we do hope that this video is a blessing to you, that you find out about what's happening in the church and you're able to study God's word with us. Um, we also understand that some people have been joining us from further afield and we would love it if you could be part of a local uh, fellowship, a local church, and, and we would love to help you with that as well. And so if we can, please get in touch with us. But it's great to have you here with us. Yeah, so we're just praying that you will be blessed and helped by this content and that Jesus will be glorified through this video. So take care, God bless. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Here are a few things coming up in the life of the church. On Saturday the 28th of May, the men are invited to come together to enjoy some breakfast together, a time of fellowship, and to consider the role of prayer triplets in our lives. To sign up for this, please contact Nigel Becker. On Sunday the 29th of May, we have our next evening of worship and prayer. Come along for 6.30pm and we'll spend some time in extended worship and praying for our church family, community and for this world. A few weeks ago, we mentioned BUS Canopy to you. This is a one-day event on the 11th of June taking place in Dunblane. We'll gather together with other churches for worship, teaching and some fun. There is a program for all ages. To book in for Canopy and to book a spot on a coach we've hired for the day, please use the links found in the weekly news. On Saturday the 18th of June, all the ladies are invited to afternoon tea here at the church. Please come along for 2pm and feel free to invite some friends. To sign up for this, you'll find a link in the weekly news. On the 19th of June, we'll have a baptismal service. If you've not yet been baptised and would like to know more about it, please contact one of the elders and we would love to spend some time with you. We're delighted to share that we will have a holiday Bible club running this year from the 15th to the 17th of August. Please pop those dates into your diary and we'll have more information regarding how to sign up in the coming weeks. If you are able to help out, please speak to Dan McElderry or Hannah White. If you are visiting and would like to know more about us, please pick up a welcome pack from the Connect Desk in there, you'll be able to read about our vision, our values, and some of the ministries that we're involved with. In there, you'll also find a chocolate bar and a tea bag to help you with all that reading. Lastly, if you would like to hear more from us, please sign up to our weekly email at hillview.cc forward slash mailing list. Good morning once again. It's lovely to see you all. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray together before diving. Yeah, Father, we, uh, what incredible uh, words that we've just been able to sing together. 
incredible words of truth, reminding us of who you are and what it means to be in Christ. Lord, we thank you for the passage that we just read, the very words of God to us. And Father, as we turn to them again, would you help us? Would you enlighten our hearts? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, this past week, um, there were some statistics released uh, regarding rates of atheism across the country. I don't know if you would have seen those. And the survey was done over the past year, and it samples over 15,000 people, and it had some, at least for me, partly surprising conclusions. In London, the rate was the lowest, and I guess it was reasonably low comparatively, and that was at 28% of people in London would describe themselves as an atheist. In Northern Ireland, it was at 31%, but elsewhere, the rates began to increase until you got to the top of the list, and that's where you found Scotland, and that's where you saw that the percentage was 54%. That is over half of the nation of Scotland that described themselves as atheist. So not even a nominally Christian, as they might have done so in the past, not even agnostic in the belief that there is maybe a God of some sort out there, but that is over half of our nation who believe definitively that there is no God. I was part of a, a gathering of Baptist ministers on Thursday morning, uh, and we spent some time in prayer for one another, uh, for our churches, uh, and for this country. And Glenn Innes was there, so some of you will remember Glenn for a number of years back. He was a member of the church here. He's now a pastor down in Portobello in Edinburgh, and he works for the Baptist Union in Scotland. So he came to spend a bit of time with us. Uh, and so he was speaking a little bit on this statistic, and he was just saying, quite frankly, that we live probably in one of the darkest places spiritually in the world. And that, I think, is a hard one for us to hear, considering what the past has been and what our history has been as a nation. And Colin Dedis spoke to, uh, to a bit of that uh, two weeks ago. But if you actually look at the statistics, we're probably actually an unreached people group now. It's incredible from years, decades, centuries, we've had the privilege of sending missionaries throughout the world to tell of who Jesus is. And we're probably in a place now where we need people to come and help us. We must all consider how we will share the good news of Jesus with those that surround us. Who are you going to give a try praying booklet to? John wrote his account of the life of Jesus in a time between, it's estimated between AD 70 and AD 100, and he was most likely in Ephesus at the time. So he was, he was writing to Jews and to Greeks who probably did not know Jesus. There's probably some similar, similarities, actually, in our times now. In these first few verses, I get the idea that he shares what he feels is of first importance. He wants to share what is of first importance to those who don't yet know Jesus. He wants them to know of who Jesus is. He wants them to come to saving faith in Jesus, and he wants them to grow deeper with him as well. So we pick up today... In John chapter 1, looking at verses 6 to 18, and thank you to Janet for reading for us. Uh, and to this, this feels like a continuation of the introduction to the book. Uh, so uh, often you have it in a report, you have three main parts in a report. You have your introduction, or an executive summary as it might be called, uh, the meat of your report, and then the conclusion. And so I always think of it as, uh, say what you're going to say, say it, and then say it again. And so for John, I think this is, he's doing like, this is what I'm going to say. This is what I'm excited to share with you. So he hits some of the high points. And so as a question, if you were to do the same, what would you write? So you saw there in verse 6, you know, we're, we are all witnesses. Yes, John Baptist came to bear witness, but we are all here to bear witness to Jesus. And so if you were to write an account of how you have seen Jesus at work in your life, what would you write and what would be the high points? What would you want to share instantly with people to grab their attention, to share of how good Jesus is? In a few verses, John packs in a lot. <laughs> and for anyone who is new to faith, anyone who's new to Christianity, it has some absolutely incredible truths that probably, if you've not been in around church, if, not, if you've not been in around God's words, would be pretty surprising. 
And for many of us here, we have probably read this passage numerous times. We've probably heard a lot of these truths time and time again. And so we need to be careful that our hearts don't become numb to them, but that we are continually filled with awe and gratitude as we read and study it. So John tells us that the God who created the heavens and the earth was born in the likeness of man. He tells us that this God dwelt with us, that he displayed his glory for the world to see in a deeply loving and caring way and invited us to be part of his family by changing us from the inside. What would you share? As you consider that question, let's look in to more of what John shared with us. And so as we look at this passage, I'm going to do things a little bit backwards here. And so I'm actually going to look at the last kind of paragraph first, then the second paragraph, and then the top one. It just seems to make more sense to me. I don't know if I'm just strange that way. And so if I'm doing it wrong, I'll speak with John when I see him in heaven and apologize then. So, uh, so in verse 14, John speaks of how Jesus took on human form to be with us. So there it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So John, for three years, got to experience daily life with Jesus, walking with him, chatting with him, eating with him, traveling with him from town to town, hearing Jesus speak day in, day out, week in, week out. You got to watch Jesus interact with hundreds of people from a variety of backgrounds and bringing hope and bringing life. His time with Jesus was tangible. It was real. No matter who you are or what you believe, we should find this truth absolutely staggering. Almighty God chose to come and be with us, being 100% human, and yet somehow in the great mystery of it all, continued to be 100% God. The ESV study Bible comments on this. This is the most amazing event in all of history. The eternal, omnipotent, omnipresent, infinitely holy Son of God took on a human nature and lived among humanity as one who was both God and man at the same time in one person. Despite our sinfulness, despite our rejection of him, he chose to come into this world. He chose to open himself up to the harshness and to the calamities of mankind. The word became flesh is a profound statement and expresses much of who God is. And so here's just a few things for us to think about. First of all, it speaks of his humility. In Philippians 2, Paul writes, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by, be, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus came in the most surprising way. He didn't come in bravado. He came in humility. When we think of how Jesus was born, it's not what he deserved. Jesus deserved to be born in a huge palace with everyone celebrating who he was, but he came in humility. He didn't come in pomp and ceremony, but he came in obedience. That the word became flesh, it speaks of God's intent to save. In Romans chapter 8, this is verses 3 and 4, and I'm going to read it from the message paraphrase. I just really like the way that it was written. It says, God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. That Jesus came into this world, it shows his love for us, and it reminds us of our plight. It reminds us of our struggle and of our utter desperation. That there is nothing in and of ourselves that we can do to save us. But Jesus can. The Word became flesh, and so there is hope. 
There is hope in no one else, but there is in Jesus. And the Word became flesh reminds us that He experienced the harshness, harshness of life. In John 11, when we get there, probably I think about January, February time, something like that, we'll read of um, the death and the resurrection of Lazarus and how that impacted Jesus. A while after that, we'll get to John 19 and we'll read of the horrific treatment that Jesus received during his trial and his death. If you know of the difficulty of life today, if you know of the sadness of life today, know that we worship a God who is able to empathize perfectly with us. The Word became flesh. He knows what it is like to live as us. As the Word became flesh, John then shares that that he dwelt among us. So to get a fuller understanding of what that word dwelt means, we need to, you need to read this as he tabernacled with us. Now that's a bit of a strange phrase, and it's certainly not one that I've used many times apart from this week in preparation. I don't know if you go around saying, oh, I'm going to come and tabernacle with you. <laughs> I doubt it. And so, but let's dig into, okay, so what does it mean that he tabernacled with us? So firstly, let's remember what the tabernacle was. So as the people of God moved around the wilderness for 40 years and then into the promised land, it was the tent where God moved in and lived with his people. This was then replaced by the temple in Jerusalem that King David was given instructions for and his son, King Solomon, then built. So what does it mean? So we're having this picture of this tabernacle. What does it mean then that Jesus tabernacled with us? So here are five things that means that he dwelt with us. First of all, it means that he has come to be central in our lives. So the tabernacle was at the center of Israel's camp. So wherever they moved, the tabernacle was in the middle, and the 12 tribes of Israel surrounded it. It was the focal point. As the tabernacle was central, Jesus has come to be central in our lives. Second of all, it means that he came to provide revelation So the tabernacle was the place in the Old Testament that Moses and the priests would go to hear from God. But now we have the word of God incarnate with us, and each of us can hear from him. Third of all, it means that each of us, because he came, each of us can have a relationship with him. So the tabernacle was the place where one person was invited once a year into the Holy of Holies to meet with God. But because Christ came for all of us, he opened the way for all of us to be welcomed in to the Holy of Holies. As Jesus died on the cross, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple, it was torn in two. And it was torn from top to bottom to show who it was that tore it. And when you think on this curtain, don't think of like a blind that we have there or the curtains that you have at home. The curtain was probably about that thick. That is some curtain. So imagine trying to tear that. But God came tore it from top to bottom, inviting us all to have a relationship with him. Fourthly, it means he came to bring enduring reconciliation. So the tabernacle was the place where forgiveness was sought for the nation of Israel through sacrifices and the shedding of blood. But now, through Jesus who came to be the Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world. He is our perfect once and for all sacrifice, and in him we find forgiveness. And lastly, he came to be the focus of our worship. The tabernacle was the place that the nation of Israel would gather for feasts and festivals to worship God. But now we gather, we worship in spirit and truth. We gather in Jesus, in his name, and then his glory, and to glorify him. He came to be central to our lives, to provide revelation, to have a rev, uh, relationship with us, to bring enduring reconciliation, and to be the focus of our worship. Jesus came to dwell with us, to tabernacle with us. There's a guy called Sam Storms. I've quoted him a few times over the years. He's a pastor in the States. And I think he summarizes this pretty well, where he says, In order to meet with God, to talk with him, and to worship him, we no longer come to a building or a tent or a structure made with human hands. We come to Jesus. 
He is the true and better tabernacle who came to be with us, to dwell among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. As I said earlier, let's not just wash over that. But let the truth of that sink deep within our hearts. And would we all be filled with awe and wonder. In verse 14, John goes on, if you want to look there. He says, we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Gospels are full of exciting, miraculous stories. And I get the feeling that as John writes this, he can't wait to start sharing all the stories and everything that he has heard throughout his time with Jesus. In our time going through this Gospel, we're going to see his glory. We're going to see his goodness on display for the world. We'll see in his first miracle of how water is turned into wine and of how straight away it's pointing towards the cross and what Jesus is going to do for us. We'll see the woman at the well and of how Jesus brings eternal hope to her and to the whole village. We'll see him healing the sick from near and afar, bringing sight to the physically and spiritually blind. We'll see him feeding thousands. We'll see him walking on water showing compassion to the marginalized, raising Lazarus from the dead, and showing humility as he washes the disciples' feet. As we go through the Gospel of John, we're going to see his goodness. We're going to see his glory. And as we read through this, we'll see that every word of Jesus is a ray of truth shining bright into our lives. And that truth has the power to set us free. Every act is a beam of his grace, his love lavished upon an undeserving people, but who are desperately in need. He is full of grace and truth, and that's what we read in the passage. Ultimately, Jesus' glory is displayed on the cross at Calvary and in the empty tomb. In John 12, verse 23, we read the words of Jesus. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Where death looks like it has a victory. With Jesus having been beaten, mocked, nailed to a cross. It's a picture of defeat. It seems to be a picture where darkness has won. But we're told there that Jesus is glorified. His glory is displayed as he conquers sin and death. He conquers the sin that we are in ourselves incapable of breaking free from. His glory is revealed as he triumphs over the grave three days later and leaves the tomb empty. And he shares that glory with us. We share in the victory by trusting in the true light. That's how John describes it. The Son of God and His glory is revealed in each and every single one of us who have trusted in Jesus as our Savior and Lord. And we also can say we have seen His glory. We see it in our own lives. But if you just look around the room, we see it in so many other people. Seriously, have a look around the room. And you see God's glory on display as in each and every single person, there is a miracle of grace. There is a miracle that we are a saved people, that we have been redeemed, that we have been forgiven. Look around the room and see how God has been at work in many different people's lives, providing for people who have been in need, bringing healing where that has been needed. John puts it, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. It's what we have received. As you look around this room, don't miss that we see what God has done and what he is doing in and through us. We'll now jump back up to the second paragraph. Sorry, remember I'm doing this in reverse. So for all that have received Christ, as it puts it, John describes us as newborns and as children of God. 
It says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will, um, sorry, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Charles Spurgeon speaks of this new birth as, the man is like a watch which has a new mainspring, not a mere face and hands repaired, but new inward machinery with freely adjusted works, which act to a different time and tune. And whereas he went wrong before, now he goes right, because he is right within. This new birth, new life, is all about the need we have for a completely new heart. So we'll jump back into the Old Testament. Uh, and so I'm going to read Jeremiah 31, just a few verses from there. Uh, but I'd encourage you, um, Martin actually preached through Jeremiah, I think it was 30 and 31, uh, back in about August time. And so please, you know, if you want to know more about these verses, uh, you can find those sermons online. So in Jeremiah 31, 33 and 34, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Then in Ezekiel uh, chapter 36, and this is 26 and 27, we read, And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give, sorry, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules. To be born again is to have a new heart, is to have new life in the spirit, to be a new creation. Receiving Christ isn't simply about making a few minor adjustments here and there. It's not about just trying to fit God in around your pre-existing schedules, priorities, and desires, but it is a radical new life, which as Charles Spurgeon puts it, acts to a different time and tune. Receiving Christ isn't an add-on or a bolt-on to our old lives. It is new. It's new life, new heart that beats to a new rhythm that is gift to, gifted to us by Jesus. And it sounds and it acts according to his will. In both those passages in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, you see the words, I will, that came up eight times in, the, uh, in those two passages. Just showing that it is only God who can do this amazing act of giving us a new heart. And John does the same thing as well. So in there in verse 13 it says, Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. This new heart and birth is not something that is passed down through bloodlines. It's, been born into a, it's not about being born into a certain family. This verse means that it doesn't matter what nation you were born in, what element of society you were born into. It's not something that can come about from the free will of man or anything that we can strive to do in ourselves. No amount of human endeavor can bring new life. It's solely God. This new birth that he gives to us is a reminder also of the removal of the past that the slate has been wiped clean of what, because of what Jesus has done. The old has gone and the new has come. The other aspect that John emphasizes in receiving Christ is to be a child of God. Our Heavenly Father doesn't simply want a bunch of forgiven people in, with him in eternity. He doesn't want just to have a bunch of people that he can stand to be around for that time. He wants us to be his children. And that he calls us his children, and we get to call him father, speaks of the relationship that he desires to have with us. God wants us to experience the fullness of having life in him, and the best way of having that is as one of his children. John speaks of this later in his later letter, 1 John chapter 3. He says, see what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. And the Apostle Paul 
in, um, in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 to 17, says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back, to, to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. In the church, we're blessed to have people of all ages here. And so we've got a lot of our children who have headed out to Children's Church and to Crash. And so we're so blessed to have them. And we've got a lot of youth in the church as well. And uh, so one of my roles from the church is the youth pastor. And so I get to spend a lot of time with the youth. Uh, and so over the years, I've been fortunate enough to be able to do some like mentoring with them. Um, over the last few months, I've been able to talk about baptism with quite a few of them. Um, I get to take them away on trips for weekends away and to Soul Survivor and to Magnitudes. And I get to go and play golf with them. Myself and Sasha are having a wee round of golf tomorrow. Uh, and I love the time that I get to spend with the youth. I really do. And each and every single Sunday night, I get to spend two hours with them. I love it. I get to spend that time. But the time that all those young people have with me is remarkably different to the time that my children have with me. There is a big difference in it. For Zoe and Rory, because they are my children, they share not just in parts of it, but they share in my whole life. They share in my and Rachel's provision, just like a roof over their heads, food on the table, clothes on their back, help with schooling, taking them to swimming lessons, ballet classes, football coaching. They, as our children, share in our love in a way that others don't. They share in our, I hope, generosity, in our time, and our experiences like no other child will probably ever know. Because they are our children, they know of the discipline like others don't. We hope, as best as possible, to share of our wisdom and knowledge with them. The, value, the values that Rachel and I have are bestowed upon them as we teach them, and as they simply observe us each day. Our time together with Zoe and Rory isn't based around schedules or activities or just when we can fit one another in. It's a constant. We're a family together. We enjoy being with one another's company and being in each other's presence. In our families, we spend that time together simply being with one another. I hope that they see grace at work. I hope they see Rachel and I as their first port of call should they need help or if they have struggles in life. I hope that for both Zoe and Rory, that they have a, like, a strong sense of belonging in our family. And beyond that, as Romans 8 kind of talked about, Zoe and Rory will receive an inheritance from us, whatever that might look like. That is something, again, that no other child will probably receive. But as our children, they are heirs to our estate. Now, that is a bit of an example of my family. But think on that multiplied hundreds, if not thousands of times over with you as a child of God. Matthew 7 says, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? We have a perfect, loving, heavenly Father who gives perfect gifts, is perfect in love, perfect and disciplined, that is always there, never runs out of patience like I do, <laughs> and has a glorious inheritance for us. I love that John des decides right at the start of this letter to describe us as children. How would you describe yourself, first of all, to someone who maybe doesn't know Jesus? Who's someone that, you know, is maybe just beginning to dig into the Bible would one of the first things that you say would be, I'm a child of God? John decides to do that. And I think as a child of God, we get a fuller picture of what it means to be part of his family. The encouragement here is also for us to have that constant posture as a child of God. So for Zoe and Rory, at some point, they're going to grow up. Not if I can help it, but they're going to grow up and they're going to go to 
college maybe, or they might go to university, or they might get jobs, I don't know, but at some point they're probably going to exercise a lot of independence from myself and Rachel. They might move out and get their own place, and I don't know what that will look like. But at some point as they grow up, they're going to exercise more and more independence. But that's where it differs here. Because we can't do that with God. We need to see our complete dependence on God time and time again. Each day when we wake up, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how many experiences of life that you might have had. It doesn't matter what successes and failures you might have had. We are constantly dependent on God. We are constantly dependent on his care, on his compassion, on his grace and his mercy. How do you posture yourselves? It is a privilege that we are a child of God. But do we sometimes rebel against that and try to show some independence? Mark 10 and verse 15, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Is your posture today as a child of God? John, as he opened up his account of Jesus, has shared a lot with us. And we're going to go into depth on all of that uh, in the coming months, if not a year and a bit. So my question at the start was, what would you share? Verses 6 to 8 are about how John the Baptist was called to witness of who Jesus is. It says he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. We are called to witness of the light so that others may believe in him. Each and every single one of us have powerful truths to share with this world. Each and every single one of us who have put their trust in Jesus Christ have a remarkable story of salvation. And we are an example of his glory on display for the world to see. You are a witness to the true light. Don't ever doubt that you have something amazing to share. Don't ever doubt that you don't have the most awesome story to share with the world. And it's not just something we share, it's someone that we share. Don't ever doubt the awesome truths that we've looked at today and that we can all receive. A few weeks ago at Ascend, uh, we were going through some of the latter chapters of the book of Acts. And we were encouraging each of them that they have a powerful uh, story to share. Uh, and so we got into some smaller groups. Uh, and so I think I was with like the third and fourth years, roughly. And uh, I asked them, just like, do you, any of you want to share a bit of your story? And I, to be honest, I think it was probably one of my highlights of the year in a sense. Because three of them very quickly said, yeah, I'll share a bit. I'll share a bit of what it means that I have received Christ. So they shared of how they became a child of God, of how they were living with that new heart. Now, they didn't use that language. They used it in their own way. But they all said that, just in different ways. We all need that encouragement that we have an amazing story to share. So what will you share? Would you share an incredible truth that the Word became flesh? Would you share of how he dwelt among us, of how he tabernacled? What stories would you share that reveal the glory of God, the goodness of God, full of grace and truth? Would you share about what it means to be born again, to have a new heart, to have a new life as a child of God? My hope and prayer is that as we go through the book of John, is that we are empowered to share more of who Jesus is with those who surround us and don't know him yet. That we would have great confidence to share with the 54% of our nation who say that he does not exist. Would we, as we go through this book, would we gaze upon his glory? And would we share the one who has saved us, who has rescued us, who has given us a new heart, and calls us his adopted son and daughter. Let's pray. Why don't we just spend a moment and just rest in that truth? 
you know Jesus today, you are part of his family. He calls you his son or daughter. Let's just rest in that. Father, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for all that you have done for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you gave up the riches of heaven to be with us. And that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And that you have made the way for us to have this incredible relationship with you, this new heart, and to be your children. Lord, we live in a world who doesn't, who don't know that. Lord, would you fill us with a a deep love and compassion for those who don't know you yet? Would you fill us with a bit of a desperation for them to come and know you, to put their faith in you and to walk with you? Or would you help us Help us consider what will we share. And we thank you that we all have an incredible story to share. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.